Bien le bonjour and welcome to this special video on Final Fantasy VIII. And as you guessed from the title, I'm gonna talk about the real bad evil guy of this game. If you never played FF8, Remastered or the original, this video will contain massive spoilers for numerous key plot elements. The So, if you want to enjoy a game released at the end of 1999, I'd strongly suggest that you leave this place immediately. Oui, that's a new marketing stunt telling people to not watch my content. Those of you who already finished Final Fantasy VIII or played one of the DCDA games might have been typing a comment to tell me that, between other nice words, the final boss was Ultimicia. Good guess, but actually no. Calm down, there is no need to be upset. You'll see very soon why it was so easy to miss out on the truth. Especially in the French version, but I bet you don't care about us poor baguettes. The true villain of FF8 wasn't Ultimisia, but Selfie! Alright, alright, I'm gonna stop here with the awful jokes. The real antagonist in FF8, sadly, was so secret and barely exploited that it's a wonder why I'm even bothering with such a long video, and that it would be so much easier to definitely admit that Ultimisia was the evil mastermind and move on. But I'm not a quitter! At least, not this time! The big bad evil guy was none other than Hein, also known as the Great Hein or the Magician, or Necromancer for whatever reason in French, which really didn't help with my research. Since no depiction of Hein ever existed in the game, and it didn't appear in any official artwork outside, I'm proudly presenting you this rendition of mine. Furthermore, he is only mentioned through two legends told by unimportant NPCs at some moments that you can far too easily miss out. You could find more details in three entries of the information section of the information section of the tutorial once you reach some points in the main story. No, the video didn't repeat itself. You had to go to the tutorial, that part of the game menu that nobody cared about, then choose information, then again information, and finally you would find some more explanations on the in-game universe, when it wasn't already explained through the main cutscenes and dialogues. Also, there was no notification whenever a new entry was added. I'm really starting to question why the devs stopped that short of being upfront. Especially considering that the game's scenario writer Kazushige Nojima himself wrote a short story in the book Final Fantasy VIII Ultimania, but only in the Japanese version published first in 1999 and again in 2006. This one is a French compilation of the Ultimania 7, 8 and 9, but I basically wasted my money on it. Hope many books will enjoy my 40 euros. Being mean for free? Check. As I don't understand Japanese, I fortunately found a translation made by the site thelivestream.net. The link is, of course, in the description. However, before diving into this short story, let's talk about the actual in-game references, and also why the French localization didn't help for some of them. To be absolutely sure that I'm not telling fibs, I asked for help to compare the original Japanese dialogues with the English and French localizations. A big shout out to Celanta Chaola, the name of her FF14 character, that helped me oh so much. I'm not even sure I correctly pronounced that name, sorry. Let's begin with the first legend, which was the easiest to miss. I'm not exaggerating, it was that old man in the town of Balamb who was telling this story to his granddaughter at only one moment in the game. And not an obvious one to boot, it was when you were about to embark for your mission to Dolet at the beginning of the first CD. 
Reminder, at this point of the game, you were stuck inside a car from the Ballum Garden University to Ballum Town. Once inside the town, the car drove itself to the docks for you to embark, with all the NPCs telling you to get a move on. Squall even walked for a bit towards the ship before a final HURRY SQUALL from Quistis. And only then you could backtrack to almost the town's entrance for your only chance at getting this dialogue. And I edited this entire segment for you. You can try by yourselves or check the description for the full uncut scene. A lot of efforts for pretty much nothing, as there was no reward outside of learning a bit about FF8's world. If you can consider that a reward. There was also no penalty if you didn't visit this man at this moment. Adding to this, the English localization made some mistakes or forgot some details. And yes, the French was slightly worse because it was based on the already flawed English translation. I know I'm being mean and negative, yet I do know the issues with the localization process, especially when you're paid dirt cheap, so I'll try to be more lenient or at least stay neutral. All in all, each version stated that Hein was a god existing at the dawn of the world and that he fought many monsters, which ended up exhausting him. Before going to sleep, he created the first human beings to complete tasks while he was resting. A bit like one of those freemium idle games on smartphones. However, when he awoke, humans multiplied like crazy. And since they were only tools to him, he decided to reduce their numbers. But, contrary to, let's say, a Sims game, humans rebelled and declared war against him. Humans ended up winning the war and Hein gave, or left, half of his body to them so he could make a run for it. Although Hein lost because of his hubris, he was smart enough to give them what amounted to an empty shell, basically a useless shed skin. You guessed that humans didn't like this one bit and tried, in vain, to find the other half. The old NPC man ended up with a strange warning about the possibility that Ayn might still be close by and watching people. It's this final sentence that made us think it may have simply been a tale for kids, like the Boogeyman or Krampus, which in turn might explain why the localization didn't put any real effort into these legends. A real shame, because when you read the Japanese version, thank you, Seanta, there were nuances that were trashed, and I'm not talking about the usual language barriers. As an example, the French version stated that Hyde was the strongest of all gods, whereas the original in English only mentioned that he was strong, not the best. The second change was related to how Hyde decided to reduce the human population. In Japanese, even if it was acknowledged how cruel this decision was, Hein killed the children. In English, Hein simply took away the children because... Step 3 profit? Of course, we French kept that idea afterwards. I don't know about you, but Hein didn't appear as evil anymore, although we never knew what he eventually did with the kids. The third slight difference that disappeared for whatever reason in the English version was that humans managed to overthrow Hein thanks to their intelligence or resourcefulness, since their numbers allowed for exchanging ideas or plans and coming up with new ones. The English version, and therefore the French one too, only mentioned that humans won through their sheer number as if they relied on the oh-so-well-loved Zergrush strategy from StarCraft. Why? Don't know! Maybe the part about humans being smart was implied, or the localization team didn't understand at all? Not their problem anyway, why didn't you learn Japanese and import the game yourselves, hmm? Finally, while the original version clearly stated how useless the body half left to the humans was, the other two mentioned some leftover magic or power inside, although far weaker than the other half. Why am I bothering myself with that detail? 
Well, it's once again related to the second legend. I suck at transitions. The second legend told the mishaps of our not-so-favorite divine being, and like the first one, you had to get out of your way to find it. With the only reward to learn slightly more about Hein. Nope, still no penalty for avoiding it. Again, it was easy to miss out on this scene, but fortunately, you could still get access to it up until the end of the third disc. Well, outside of when you couldn't, but let's not go there. At the beginning of the third CD, Edea asked you to find the ship of the White Seeds. Once aboard the ship, those White Seeds refused to talk to you, including all the other non-important NPCs, with a few exceptions, but that's not what this video is about. Then, you had to speak to the captain, this time in his cabin. If you got on the ship after Edea told you to and gave you her letter, the captain decided to be slightly more welcoming. It was rather logical for you to speak to him a second time after this first dialogue, since he doesn't even leave the cabin. Following this other dialogue, you ended up at the helm of your university-turned-airship, ready to push the main plot forward, or board the White Seeds boat again to watch, or more precisely read, the second Legend of Hein if you didn't leave the captain's cabin between the two dialogues, because that dang NPC was at the complete opposite of the ship in an almost hidden area. Why did the devs do that? I'm as clueless as you. There weren't a lot of new informations compared to the first legend, but they were still rather interesting, as long as you didn't play in French. First off, the book the NPC was reading was called The Legend of Vascaroon, apparently a great human sage. I said apparently because his identity was never really developed upon. Getting even murkier in the Ultimania short story, but I'll get back to it. Next, Hein was described as the ruler of the world. Talk about some fancy title. Finally, another event took place after Hein's body splitting, a war between humans over the ownership of that body half. The duration of the war wasn't clearly stated in Japanese, only alluding to a really long period of time, while the English decided to narrow it down to decades. This war was won by someone called Zebalga and his clan of the same name. He then went to Hein's half-body and asked it to bestow its powers onto him. However, that half remained silent in the English version, whereas it seemed to vaguely answer in the original. In both cases, that was when Vaskarun showed up to explain the situation about this body half, that it was merely a shed skin or an empty shell, without any real power like in the first legend. The small or huge difference between the Japanese and English versions was how Vaskaroon was introduced and how he broke the news to Zebalga. In the original, Vaskaroon tried to understand what was wrong before realizing that they were tricked by the elusive god. Then he revealed his findings to the king Zebalga. Maybe I'm grasping at straws, but this implied that Vaskaroon was at Zebalga's sides during the war. He might have even been the clan's counselor or strategist and brought them to victory, because he was apparently so smart. Or perhaps I'm just spouting nonsense. In the American version, Vaskaroon popped out of nowhere to reveal everything to Zebalga. I don't know about you, but it looked like Vaskaroon knew that this whole war was waged over pretty much nothing, yet kept his mouth shut. Ah yes, such a great sage. Why did the English version change that part in that way? I don't know, maybe the team didn't give a hoot, and I'm just acting like a literature teacher trying too hard. In the end, Zebalga and his clan went all forehead vein popping angry, and tried to hunt down the other half of the god that dared double-cross them, but to no avail. Hein became known as the magician, and even after many generations, humans never found any clue of his whereabouts. Or keep that in mind for later. What about the French version? Oh, that one? 
First off, they completely discarded any mention of Vaskarun and the book was called The Legend of Hein. In that book, Hein was described as a magician, sorry, a necromancer, I'll never understand why they chose that word, who went for a nap just to discover after waking up that he all of a sudden had a lot of neighbors and a really noisy type. Guess how he reacted? 1. He packed his suitcase and moved to a quieter place. 2. He called the police or any form of authority on those noisy neighbors, since he was an upstanding citizen relying on the law. 3. He asked them politely to lower the volume. 4. He decided to burn in 8 people with his fire magic. If you selected anything other than number 4, you have chosen poorly. We, oui, they did not even mention that Hein killed children, only part of the people. Of course, when you see someone you didn't invite start a barbecue with your other neighbors, literally, you won't just gently stand by and let things happen. Hein wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed either because he almost immediately surrendered and was made prisoner. Must have been the first and only actual French person of FF8. Then people asked for half of his body as war reparations. Boy, that sure escalated quickly. Hein followed through, but people started a civil war, yes again, over the ownership of that body half. That new war lasted for 50 years and the King Zebelga emerged victorious. Why 50 years? No idea, maybe someone in the localization team had his birthday coming soon? But after 5 decades, the magic powers left Heinz body half. Reminder that this half wasn't supposed to have any sort of power to begin with, so we deviated quite a lot again. And eventually, we had this gem as a conclusion. That's all. It's a really dumb story, don't you agree? Do you remember when I said that I would try to be lenient or neutral? That's really not easy. This isn't doctored, it really ended like this without talking about the search for Heinz's other missing half. Do you understand now why I said that we were slightly screwed over in France regarding Heinz's backstory? We're done here with the two in-game legends. But before we head towards the famous short story by the scenario writer Kazushige Nojima in the FF8 Ultimania from 1999, I'll quickly gloss over the three tutorial entries. Glossing over because they basically just repeated what was already said in the two legends. The French, again, added masculine counterparts with Necromancien, which is the male version of Necromancer, when the female was Necromancienne. This alluded to possible male hosts for Heinz magic or will, whereas the original and English only had sorceresses. It might have been because of Adele since the French localization couldn't stick to only male or female pronouns for her throughout the game. So yeah, it didn't help us poor souls living in the kingdom of baguettes and croissants. Besides, that first entry was presented as a theory about the origins of witches and Heinz magic. The French went rogue and cut out the sentence about trying to not spread that power too thin. Maybe to avoid losing control over those witches? The second entry was about the process of transferring ownership of sorcerer's power between two witches. But the French version, yes, again, cut the part about not needing to be blood-related, they just needed the right potential. We had to wait until the end of the game to finally learn the reason for this transfer. A sorceress couldn't be free to die as long as she was carrying Hein's gift inside her. This rule might have had something to do with Hein needing a healthy body. But it was never explained what would happen if the dying sorceress wasn't nearby a potential host. Personally, I think it showed that Heine, despite his life as a parasite, was still immortal. And being held captive of a completely inert body was perhaps his biggest fear. But we've been shown that Edea and Artemisia could control other people from far away. So, it doesn't seem like it would have been much of a problem in the end. 
Sorry, I digressed again. The third entry was only about the great Hein in Japanese and English, crediting him as the creator of mankind and supposedly the first sorceress. It also explained that it was a sign of great respect to call the sorceress Hein's descendant. Why not? The French version only called him Hein, but he was credited as the world's creator and first sorcerer. On top of cutting that part about Hein's descendant, don't bother asking me why. Now, let's talk about the Ultimania short story. It was a lesson about the witches given by a female teacher in Balham Garden University. We started off with yet another Legend of Hein that I will consider as the final mix plus plus director's cut with extra cheese and knuckles from now on. This time, Hein apparently created the world as well as the day and night cycle, but I think it was more in the sense of shaping or reshaping the world because he had to fight against a lot of monsters to do so. This meant that there were inhabitants and an actual world before Hein started redecorating. Hein was established as a divine creator and conqueror thanks to his magic powers. Of course, this was extremely tiresome, so he decided to rest on his throne and enjoy the view, but a mountain was preventing him from watching over the Eastern Sea. Exhausted by his battles and work, he came up with the idea of creating those infamous tools that he would call human beings to carve the mountain while he was taking a nap. Those male and female humans were granted some level of freedom and the ability to multiply by themselves. Unfortunately, when you are an immortal divine being, time doesn't really feel the same, especially when you just invented the day and the night, and maybe the actual time itself. Humans carved up the mountain completely, all the while exponentially growing up in numbers. Then, they went back to their creator to ask what he desired next, but he was still sound asleep. So, since they got bored of waiting, they started to change the rest of the world to their own discretion. When Hein finally awoke, everything around him had completely changed. A bit like letting your kids play with everything without any rule in your house. However, what shocked Hein the most was the insane amount of humans going around. That's when he decided to reduce their numbers by killing the children with his fire spells. When the humans not so politely disagreed, Hein just told them that they were only tools and had no rights to contest his decisions. You know what happened next, Hein lost against the humans, who then fought amongst themselves, Zebelga, Vascaroon, so on and on. Talking about Vascaroon, the teacher explained that there were other stories and legends in that book, apparently all written by Vascaroon. All of them talked about Vascaroon's adventures and inventions, but Hein was never mentioned again whatsoever. On top of that, if Vascaroon did live through all those other stories, he would have been 980 years old. So, either Vascaroon was more of a title than an actual name, or other people stole his identity for obvious reasons. Or, Hein was actually Vascaroon. But that doesn't really fit into the rest of the Ultimania short story. The teacher then talked about a man named Temu who lived 500 years before the events of that short story, and who came up with a new theory, the sorceresses were linked to Hein's magic. Taking a step further, if Hein's other half was never found, it was simply because he hid himself inside the bodies of human beings. You have to admit that seeing a flying, floating or crawling half-body would have alerted pretty much everyone. Perhaps thanks to his powers, he could junction himself to other humans, yes, like a G-Force. Probably because of the two wars, he might have realized that women were usually far more protected than men, so they were obviously the better choice as a place to hide inside. I'm aware it sounds kinkier than it should be. Moreover, sorceresses were said to have held positions of power throughout FF8's world history, most certainly thanks to their magic. 
or because of Hind's influence as a parasite. One likely evidence in-game of the junctioning process was in the ending cutscene when Ultimisia transferred her magic to Elea. The other example would be how Adele partially fused with Rinoa's body at the beginning of the fourth CD. Talking about Adele, I will make one assumption. I'm sure that Hein escaped with his upper body half, but more on that later. Although it was stated that many sorceresses may have existed, the short story only mentioned three without naming them. The first one lived in ancient but unspecified times and she used her powers for the good of her people. In FF8's universe, a movie was made where she appears with her knight Zephyr. Yes, the same movie where we played as Laguna at the beginning of the third disc. And yes, yes, I'm aware that Zephyr sounded oddly similar to Safer, Squall's rival. Safer also mentioned multiple times that his dream was to become a sorceress knight. My guess is that his parents gave him this name because of the movie, or it was just a coincidence. However, it wouldn't surprise me if that movie had a huge impact on Safer's life. The second sorceress was described as the one that started the Sorceress War, event that was briefly mentioned in the game, so it could only have been Adele. No, not the singer, but that giant redhead that ruled over Estar. Or the teacher in the story was referring to a previous war. I don't know, but that's still a possibility. By the way, it was because of this sorcerous war with Adele, or its consequences, that our heroes ended up as orphans outside of Rinoa. The third witch was the one who collaborated with the science, even Dr. Odin himself to be precise, to unravel the mysteries of magic. Some of the known benefits of that research was the ability to download G-forces through a computer or the famous junction system called Paramagic. No clue was given about the identity of that third sorceress, unfortunately. Small trivia, the French version made a mistake, again, in the tutorial entry about Dr. Odin, who had his name changed to Geyser, but that's not the mistake I mentioned. Although it wasn't completely wrong to assume the following, the French localization explained that Odin developed paramagic by observing Adel, which was never something said in either the original or English localizations. Now, you know another useless trivia thanks to me! I believe that this unnamed witch might have been the one who transferred her powers to Elea when she was young, but that doesn't really fit in the chronology. Or maybe it was simply Elea herself after being warned by the future Squall. She would have then tried to prepare for the events to come as best as she could. I haven't found any evidence at all, sorry. So you'll have to take it with a grain of salt like my other theories that I will finally address. Let's recap one last time what we learned about Hyde. He was an extremely powerful and ambitious god who thought he could reshape the world into something better, according to him, thanks to his great magic powers. Since the locals were in the way, Hein tired himself out by fighting them off on top of his original plan. In the end, he was too exhausted to put the finishing touch, so he created the humans to deal with it instead. As his nap lasted for a lot longer than anticipated, humans multiplied far more than he considered acceptable. Therefore, he decided to violently resolve the overpopulation problem. Because humans didn't like the idea at all, they rebelled against Hein and eventually won. Hein negotiated his freedom by giving them half of his body because he was a god with incredible magic abilities. Unfortunately, what he truly gave them was an empty shell, while he got away with his soul and actual magic powers in the other half. Humans fought amongst themselves for that body half, then discovered that they were duped, so they tried to find the manager to complain about it, but to no avail. 
I just want to point out that none of the two in-game legends nor three tutorial entries explained what happened to that useless health given to the humans. In Ultimania, the teacher gave almost no clue outside of inquiring about it for GLG classwork. I have no idea what she meant by that. The idea of an evil sorceress coming from a distant future to destroy the world was far from awful, don't get me wrong. But consider the following. This time compression was in fact Heinz's ultimate payback. A defeated yet immortal god forced to live as a parasite for centuries, full of resentment and finally about to correct his biggest mistake. Granting free will to humans. So, you guessed it, even though I said the word theory, there have been too many clues here and there to ignore that Hein was, indeed, our true enemy. Unfortunately, since it was never directly stated in game or admitted by the developers, I can't definitely confirm that it was 100% the undeniable truth. We can still go deeper, though. Let me show you how some of those puzzle pieces fit together, in addition to those I kept hidden in my sleeves, until now. Do you remember when I talked about the three entries in the information section of the information section of the tutorial? I haven't told you when they were available. The first two, that briefly mentioned Hein and how his powers were transferred, or should I say junctioned, from a sorceress to a new one, were unlocked at the same time, after Edia's first appearance in the first CD, when she charmed a safer who was holding the President Delling hostage. Yes, I reloaded countless saves to find the right moment myself. For the third entry, directly about the Great Hein, take a guess. Okay, I never liked padding the runtime for no reason, so here's the answer. At the beginning of the third disc, after Edea revealed the identity of Ultimicia and her plan about the time compression. Well, actually, I made a mistake, sorry, that entry was unlocked when you talked to Seed located behind Edea. But since talking to him wasn't mandatory to progress in the main story, you could finish the game without ever unlocking that entry. I can't help but think that the devs may have given up on the big reveal, or that they just messed up the programming. For the last clues, we had to focus on Ultimicia herself in the Japanese version. This may not come as a surprise for most of you, especially this far in this video, but because of the language barriers, the localization process can alter the meaning of sentences, or at least some nuances. Once again, I had to rely on the English translation made, this time, by Radiant Butterfly, 8 years ago already. Of course, you can find the link to her blog post in the description. However, since it was not 100% professionally made, all my arguments have to be taken with a grain of salt. First off, where did we fight Ultimicia? In her castle's throne room. Yes, imagine how important this place became if we were actually facing against Hein. Mind blown. Or it was just the good old cliché of fighting the big bad antagonist in the castle's throne room. I wouldn't be so bold to assume that this was the original throne room where Hein created human beings, but still, picture this in your head. Finally finding Hein's other half in a similar room and settling the score with him. And we're not done yet. Her monologue before starting the battle gave more details about why she devised the time compression plan. She also used more speech markers associated with men than women when speaking, which was sadly something impossible to convey with a simple eye. 
If Altimicia or Heine wanted to create this dimension, it was because not only would they have been the only being able to survive, but also the only one to grant that ability to others. Or take it away! Thus, Hein would never have to fear betrayal again, or else the punishment would be insane torments. To put it simply, Hein's tools would do nothing else but worship him and obey. Vengeance is a dish best served cold, am I right? Of course, that only applied if it was truly Hein we were facing against. The few other lines of dialogue weren't all important for this video, so I'll directly jump to the final phase. With everything I said so far, you may have already realized it, but that model clearly showed that Ultimicia, I mean the human part, wasn't at the helm anymore. Upside down with closed eyes and covered in weird vines shackling her, while this monstrosity right out of an HP Lovecraft book was towering us. Regarding the dialogue, the way she spoke became more detached and creepier, as if we weren't facing against something human anymore, which was rather likely if we paid attention to the arena. Although it wasn't easy to see, the bottom part of this ultimate form was a giant cape on top of which our hero stood on. Far from a simple artistic choice, it showed that we entered his domain completely at his mercy, so it added some gravitas to his lines. I'd even go further by saying that the different arenas of this final battle were rewinding back through time to the FF8 world's origins as it was presented in the Legends of Hein, which I already explained. Maybe we traveled back to when Hein was born, appearing like the Big Bang in the Endless Void, ready to create a new world or reshape it differently. But once again, I'll let you forge your own opinions, or else I will be talking your ears off. However, the last sentences as the fight was nearing its conclusion could sound slightly cryptic. The common theory was that Japanese love the themes of memory inconsistency, that we end up forgetting everything progressively, whether we want it or not, despite our best efforts. Personally, I think it was an attempt at coaxing us into giving up the fight, if my theory about this ultimate form being Hein was true. Maybe as a last-ditch effort, because Hein, or at least his hostess, was literally dying. Also, it was impossible to end the fight before the boss said all of the lines because of the game's script, but that's an irrelevant trivia. Up until now, Hein or Ultimicia was really arrogant, trying to provoke or demean us by claiming there was no way of winning against him. Her? You get my point. However, if you remember, Hein already managed to negotiate his way out of a sticky situation in the past. So, it doesn't seem too far-fetched to assume he was trying to convince us that the world inside the time compression wasn't so horrible. If Hein was eternal and humans would rely entirely on him, without bothering with that pesky free will, all they would have to do is to think about Hein and worship him. Awkwardly, or in vain, he wanted us to accept his world by scaring us with the problems caused by the passage of time. While the time compression would have allowed humans to live forever, they would have become eternal slaves. But all of this is just a theory that would require a confirmation from Kazushige Nojima or even the producer Yoshinori Kitase. To put an end to this already too long video, I'll cover some final theories, such as why Adele looked like this. Technically, if we only relied on the Japanese language, there wasn't any gendered pronoun or physical description for Hein. We could argue about the need for a god to have an actual gender, 
But I'm gonna assume that he was probably or mostly male, because of what I explained regarding Ultimicia's dialogue. He did originally have a body, though. It's a possibility that he could still divide his remaining half-body or at least project his will onto someone like the Sorcerer's Power and Embodiment entry claimed. Also, if you remember, it was said in the Japanese and English versions of the Sorcerer's Tutorial entry that there was a will to avoid spreading the magical powers to too many people at the same time. Maybe because it would break the mind control? That would also explain how he could still operate from the future despite Adele being turned into a space popsicle. If he only went from one body to another, what would have happened if the body was completely stuck? What could be better than a plan B to exploit the right opportunity another day? Which ended up being the famous machine created by Odine that copied Elon's power. By the way, Elon's infamous power wasn't considered, in fact, as magic, but as a limit break akin to Christie's blue magic or Selfie's slot. What about Adele's body, then? I don't really need to explain more, I think that Adele's form was actually the closest to Hein's original body, at least the upper half, and that was due a lot to Estar's technology. It's not completely crazy to imagine that Hein couldn't reassemble his entire body, because everyone knew how he looked and or the other half withered away or disappeared. Consequently, because of his life as a parasite or G-Force, he may have tried, voluntarily or not, to change the body of his hostess. Small reminder that Hein wanted to reshape the world without consulting the original inhabitants. So, I'm not pulling this idea out of my... Uh, hat. He also needed a compatible body, example with Adele literally sending her troops around the world to kidnap young girls such as Elon. No clue was given as to what qualified you for a junction with Hein. So, let's not bother with it. But a compatible body wasn't the only thing that mattered. And it's not so hard to imagine that the first attempts at junctioning weren't a total success. What upheld this theory of Hein transforming a body was the fight against the Eleven Witches during the time compression at the start of the 4th CD. They all had quite unconventional bodies, especially the last one. And it's finally time to bring back what I said about Hein keeping his upper half when he ran away. Because when you looked at Adele and the other witches, there was one detail that should have caught your attention. Something was not right with the lower part of their bodies. Although Adele was literally shirtless, she hid her lower part with a dress so long that the end of it was laying on the ground. Scan didn't help either if you rotated the model to look under, so forget about it. Same issue with the first sorceresses during the time compression fight, who weren't covering all of their top skin, but had a dress covering their legs. Yes, same results when using scan. Stop looking at me like this, I was only doing that for the video, I swear! The second type of witches covered their entire body even if we could mostly identify a human shape, save for the red eyes. Yes, nothing either with Scan. And there's no need to comment on the last sorceress. Perhaps because Hein was lacking a bottom, he had some troubles keeping the integrity of his victim's lower half as he took over their bodies. And in my humble opinion, we could interpret this battle in two ways. The first one, we were traveling back in time and we watched how Hein refined their process in reverse. That means that the most human-looking witches were the most recent but the weakest at the same time, while the last one was the strongest but also the most terrifying. Or, the second option, we monitored the different stages of Hein's corrupting influence in Fast Forward. To be completely honest, I'm gonna sit on the fence here. Oh, by the way, even the first form of Ultimicia had her legs considerably darkened, 
While her last form was comprised of two upper body halves glued to each other, straight out of the solitaire card game. But wait, there were more similarities outside of the bottom part. All of them had claws as well as strange markings or tattoos and grey or even white skin. Let's not forget about those wings and or horns that I consider as a sign of a more advanced form of possession. Do you understand now why I gave him wings and horns in my doodles? Sadly, this is yet another theory I can't definitely prove. Here's another theory, this time about the creation of the world and the moon, as well as why the latter was populated by monsters. In the Ultimania story, it was said that Hein not only created the world, but also the day and night cycle. Both of these events may have been more closely related than at first glance. I'm sure that they were originally the same celestial body and Hein took apart the pieces he didn't like or need. The moon could be, in fact, a giant ball of remnants or offcuts. And what was better than using this place as a prison for all the vanquished monsters, making sure that they wouldn't pester him anymore during his work? That would also explain why monsters tried to invade, or actually return to Earth, because they could claim that Heine stole their world from them, or escape from the jail that the moon became. About this jail thing, here's a funny anecdote about the French localization that already pushed this idea. While the English and Japanese versions only described the moon as having mystical properties, the French one directly jumped to the conclusion that it was actually a penitentiary for monsters. However, I'm sure that the team didn't put too much thought into it, if you remember what already happened with Heinz Legends. Anyway... Penultimate theory, I'd like to talk about the tomb of the unknown king we had to visit at the end of the first CD. Although we only needed to look for a student ID card near the entrance of the labyrinth part, if you pushed the exploration further, you could obtain the brother's G-Force. Why am I talking about this? Well, you see, once you got the G-Force, the ghost of the last king of Dolet came out of his tomb and congratulated, congratulated, thanked us for setting his soul free. Do you remember that Hein wasn't the only god to exist in the world of FF8? I think that the G-Forces were actually the gods that lost against Hein when he initiated his world conquest and redesign. Another detail, we were told that junctioning G-Forces was a recent discovery by Dr. Odine called Paramagic. But the events that took place in the tomb made me think that some ancient kind of junctioning might have existed, and that it had the same issues as being possessed by Hein. The body of the host had to get rid of the god it was junctioned to. Otherwise, why would both Minotaurs have a crown symbol on their pauldron if they didn't have any tie to Dolet's last emperor or nobility? So, taking this into consideration, maybe humans received the help from those gods when they waged war against Heine. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, as the saying goes. Oh well, you know the risks when you come up with theories without any real evidence. I would actually need to ask the developers themselves. And the last theory, the knights. It was implied that sorceresses had knights at their service, usually lovers like Zephyr in the movie, or Squall and Rinoa pass some moment in the main story. Outside of the obvious need for protection, because those witches were often in positions of power, such as a queen or an advisor, I think there was another benefit, slowing down Hein's ability to take over his hostess. Even Safer was related to Idea since she was the nurse at the orphanage. She perhaps showed him the movie about Zephyr, or at least told the story. However, if we consider that Heinz's takeover was indeed inevitable, 
Maybe the infected or possessed witches found some comfort or solace with their knights by their side? Maybe Adele was so cruel because she didn't have a knight to support her? Same thing with Ultimicia? In the end, all we knew was that Hein was immortal, or at least his will could survive through his magic. But our heroes found the only recourse to stop him, maybe unconsciously or through dumb luck. First, forcing him to reunite all of his fragments scattered through time into this final form during the fight against Ultimisia. Then, lock him up in a time loop, forever forced to lose against Squall and friends, while those lived happily ever after. Voila! We're done with it! Or are we? I don't feel like I have anything else to cover or add, unless I end up in a tinfoil hat. Again. So, I bid you farewell and I... Wait. Do you hear this? <laughs>